There are certain professions at times that uh, I think uh, maybe get a bum rap as to uh, things like greed or covetousness. Uh, the American Civil Liberties Union has not done, I think, the law profession uh, much good over the kinds of uh, cases and things that they take. Some have uh, called the ACLU the Antichrist's Lawyer Union or against citizens of the law union, or against Christian living, or against Christian liberty union. The law has received a bum rap at times. The Apostle Paul, having completed chapters 6 and the beginning of chapter 7, has not been speaking against the law, but speaking about the misuse of the law how the law does not produce spirituality, how the law does not produce godliness and righteousness, that the law is not the way of living. And the conclusion may be of someone, well, Paul is against the law, or the law is bad, the law is not good. And so in Romans chapter 7, beginning at verse 7, Paul wants to address the goodness of the law. And basically, in these six verses, he says that the law is holy and righteous and reveals the sinfulness of sin because sin combines with the good law to produce sin and death. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? In the sense, is the law bad? Is the law unrighteous? His answer Meganoita, certainly not. Indeed, he said, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. It is the purpose of the law to expose sin. It is the purpose of the law to make us aware of sin so that we will avoid sin. And ignorance of the law can be very detrimental to us. I've shared this personal illustration before, but I, I think it is apropos here, for it's the only time in my life that I have been arrested. I was out in California several years ago visiting some cousins. Dan was just a little guy. And uh, the cousin said, you know, we ought to go over to the uh, Los Angeles area beach and down over by, you know, the SeaWorld area and uh, collect some shells. And uh, let's, they have these beautiful abalone shells. And uh, let's go down and collect those. And so I thought, well, this is a cool thing. Go out and collect some shells. And so we parked at the beach and we walked down to the beach and we each had buckets, which my cousin willfully provided, and uh, we went around picking up uh, these beautiful shells. We'd been out there for more than an hour and a half or so, and he was out farther than I was at this particular time, and when I turned around and looked, I saw this uh, gentleman in a uniform, couldn't tell what kind of uh, officer he was, but he was walking towards me at a fairly quick pace, and he wasn't smiling. And I thought to myself, I think I'm in trouble. <laughs> but I can't be in trouble. I'm just picking seashells. And I thought to myself, maybe you ought to drop your bucket. <laughs> but then I thought, well, why do you have to drop your bucket? You're not doing anything wrong. As he approached the beach, he asked me to come up out of the water, and so I did. And he informed me that this was an area where you are not allowed to pick up seashells. I asked him, I didn't know that. My cousin out there <laughs> brought me down here. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. And he sat me down, and uh, he was going to handcuff me. And he looked at that time. Diana and Dan uh, came running up. I mean, he was just a little guy. And uh, he said, oh, I don't want to handcuff you in front of your son, so please just sit down. And he went 
to measuring my seashells, as he called my cousin in. Well, the long and short of it is, there was a sign years ago that had been gone for years up on the top of the beach entrance that said no seashell picking. But it was gone. And I said, officer, I didn't know. I didn't know the law. I'm from Michigan. We don't know about these things. Oh, this is a, this is a state law up and down the seacoast. And so he was going to haul me off to jail. And then he looked at little Dan and he said, oh, well, I don't want to cuff you in front of your son because I'm going to really, uh, you know, scare him. So, uh, Mr. McLean, will you promise to appear before a hearing uh, in two days? Oh, I'll be there. You know, it was the next day we were supposed to be flying out. And so I appear in jail or in the court system. And, you know, the first case is a robbery. The next case is uh, other serious things. And so we're sitting there for a couple of hours listening to these terrible crimes of these people. And uh, then came a, a seashell case. But it wasn't mine. It wasn't mine. There was a gentleman before us who had been harvesting these shells, these abalone shells, because apparently the inside, the animal that lives inside, is very, very valuable, very expensive delicacy, and he had been caught with several hundred of them. But he didn't show up for his case, and uh, the judge fined him $100 a seashell. Well, I started to do the math real quick. <laughs> I, I'd done blown my family's inheritance. <laughs> Fortunately, all of our seashells had been returned to the sea, and we only received a $50 fine, which was a whole lot of money to us back then. But I was convicted of a misdemeanor, and it was on my record for a few years until, uh, I think, a three-year period. Now, I wish I would have known about that law. It would have saved me a lot of aggravation, a lot of humiliation and embarrassment. But I didn't. There are people today who think that ignorance is an excuse, and it is not. The Apostle Paul says the law is good because the law exposes sin. And that is why we need to know the law. We need to know the principles behind God's law. We need to know the scriptures. Because it is the scriptures that warn us and that will protect us from the problem of sin. Now, the one that the Apostle Paul mentions is an interesting one. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. Now, what is coveting? What does it mean to covet something? Well, open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20 in verse 17, where this is one of the... Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17. In the law, in the Ten Commandments, God teaches through Moses, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Covetousness is a desire for something that belongs to someone else. It's an attitude of greed. In Proverbs chapter 119, the word covetousness is translated as ill-gotten gain. It says, such is the end of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. Proverbs 15, 27 says, A greedy man, a covetous man, brings trouble to his family because he who hates bribes will live. Covetousness. 
covetousness is also described in the book of Proverbs as a person who doesn't have the ability to give, to give joyfully, to give graciously, to give charitably to the cares of the poor, to the cares of the widow, to the cares of the orphan, to the person who is in trouble. Covetousness is hoarding things to oneself also. It's, it's the eyes of lust that look on the world and sees things and constantly craves and craves and desires it. Or the attitude that just hoards everything to oneself and doesn't have a compassionate and, and caring heart to give to those who are in need. Verse 8, Paul says, But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, and this is a word that we have seen earlier in the book of Romans. It is the word that, was, that means a military base of operations, a beachhead upon which then you would attack the rest of the land. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from the law, sin is dead. The law, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, to the unregenerated person, to the non-believer, is just a blinking sign that says, I want more, I want more. I want more. And it exposes the sinfulness of sin. Covetousness is, is an attitude in where, where you're never satisfied with what you have. It can rob a person of the joy of what they do have. They are ever dissatisfied. Covetousness creates a lack of thanksgiving or a lack of gratitude, a kind of disgruntled attitude where you reject what you have because you always want something else. It leads to disappointment, to depression, to discouragement, because you never have what you want. You are always grasping and hoping for something else. In Galatians 5, verse 13, Paul said, You, my brothers, you were called to freedom, but do not your, use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, you should learn to serve one another. Yes, the law is good. The law is righteous. And in the life of the Apostle Paul, it exposed an inner attitude that he had of covetousness. Now, Romans chapter 7, verse 9 says this, Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, Sin sprang to life, and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. The sin of covetousness is the one that killed the Apostle Paul. Now, it's interesting. Of all the Ten Commandments, nine of the Ten Commandments could result in the death penalty. Picking up sticks on the Sabbath. Abuse and dishonor towards a father and mother, using the Lord's name in vain. Nine of the Ten Commandments could be judged with death. Only one could not, the sin of covetousness. Because covetousness is an internal attitude. It is an attitude of the heart. How do you convict somebody of covetousness? How do you prove covetousness in a court of law? It's an internal attitude. They say, oh, you're coveting that. Oh, no, I'm not. I only want that so I can help other people. I only want that for this or that attitude. You know, covetousness is an internal attitude. And the Apostle Paul says, you know, when I, when I was living, I could keep nine of those ten commandments. But the one I couldn't keep was that one about coveting. And that's the one that killed me killed me spiritually. Sin sprang to life and I died. In verse 10, he says, I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. Here again, I think the NIV translators have missed the mark. 
For nowhere does the Bible teach that the law brings life. The law promotes life. It protects life. But the law does not bring life. Life is only brought by the grace of God, by spiritual rebirth. But the purpose of the commandment is to protect life, to preserve life, to guide and direct us with life. And that is why we have to get behind the law and see the principles that are the foundation of it. Young people, particularly, they rebel against the law. Well, you know, don't tell me how to dress. Don't tell me how to act. Don't tell me this. Don't tell me that. I don't like this law. I don't like that law. And so often they're just looking at the law, and there's the sinful uh, part that embraces the law improperly, rather than seeing the principles behind the law. If, if there's a standard at a school or in a home or in a community that says uh, these are the things we ought not to do. Uh, Don't look at the law. Look at the principle behind the law. Why is that law there? What is it protecting? What is it preserving? What, What is it trying to influence for the goodness of life? And you have to see the bigger principle behind it. Someone might say, well, you know, what's wrong with covetousness? It's just an internal look. Or someone might say, uh, well, it's okay to look, you just can't touch. (laughs) You're missing the principle behind it. The principle behind it is a spiritual life and spiritual living. And the fact that uh, the Christian life is not what we don't do, but what we do do. Paul says, I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life, it actually brought death. Why? Verse 11. For sin, again, seizing the opportunity. That's the key phrase in this particular section of Scripture. Getting a beachhead. For sin, seizing the opportunity. Getting a beachhead afforded by the commandment deceived me. And through the commandment put me to death. It's the deception factor. Now, this particular word for deception is used two other times in the New Testament. 1 Timothy 2.14 says, Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Now, again, we ask the question, who brought sin into the world? Not Eve or to mankind, but it was Adam. Eve was deceived, but Adam willfully rebelled. The other passage, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Sin deceives us. Sin takes an opportunity to fool us. And rather than heeding the warning... We avoid the warning because we say, well, it's not there. It's not real. I'm going to be the exception to the rule. It won't happen to me. And we embrace it and we pay the penalty for it. On this particular uh, trip to Florida, we had three separate flights. We hopped our way on El Chipo. And uh, four of these flights were in very little planes. And if you've been on these little planes, these prop planes, you see them on the tarmac, and you can see the prop. But as soon as the engine starts, you don't see that prop anymore, do you? I was fascinated as I sat in my window and watched the landscape through the prop. Now, they've got all kinds of warning signs around these props. Don't go near the prop. But, you know, when that plane is... uh, the engines are fully rotating, you can't see that prop. You can see right through it. And if somebody were to say, don't walk up there because there is a prop there and you're going to be shredded if you walk up there, if you were to look at it and say, there's no prop there, I don't see any prop there. I hear an engine, but I don't see a prop there. 
I can see right through the prop. I can see you on the other side of the prop. If you were to ignore the warning and walk up, you'd learn a lesson, wouldn't you? The fact that you in your physical senses cannot understand the danger, maybe don't feel the danger, doesn't mean that the danger isn't there. And that's the way human nature is so often with the principles of law. We, we see the law. There's a sense in which we know what the law is saying. We know that there's a warning there, but we just don't believe it. We don't heed it. And then we go through and violate the law, and we pay the penalty. Now, open up your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 3, because it is clear that the Apostle Paul is alluding to the Genesis account when he talks about the utter deception that the law pulls over humankind. In Genesis chapter 3, beginning verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now that's not what God said, was it? God told Adam, you shall not eat of one tree, only the tree that is in the midst of the garden. And we see that there is a distortion here of what God's word says. You must not eat from any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. Her answer is half right and half wrong. For God did not say anything about touching the tree. He just spoke about eating the fruit. The response of the serpent is an absolute and emphatic denial of what God said. Verse 4, You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. First, he distorts the word of God, and now he blatantly opposes, refutes, and changes the word of God. The Hebrew text, in one sense, could be translated, well, that's absolutely ridiculous. You're not going to die. That's just not going to happen. That's absolutely crazy. Verse 5, for God knows... Here's the suspicion. Here's the, de the deception. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, that part was true. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree, that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. You see the rationalization going on here. Rather than believing and accepting the commandment, she begins to rationalize. The fruit of the tree is good. It's so beautiful. It's desirable. She took some and ate it. She also gave to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. They violated the law. They violated the principle of the garden because they were deceived and they rationalized about it. Not Adam. Timothy tells us that Adam fell willingly, knowingly. And because of that, the consequences of death came upon all of humanity. Verse 12. So then, Paul says, in Romans seven twelve. so then the law is holy. The commandment is holy. The commandment is righteous. And the commandment is good. When it says that the law is holy, it means that it is a distinct, principle that provides for godly living. 
When it is righteous, it means that it is just, that it is good for life, it is good for society, it is good for citizenship. When it is good, it is wholesome, and it is productive for life. Yes, it is true, the law does not produce spirituality. The law does not produce godliness. But the principles behind it preserve life and protect life and are to be understood and to be followed. We have examples in the scripture of people like Samson. Samson, who was raised and inducted into the Israelite faith as a Nazarite. A Nazarite who was not to cut his hair, who was not to... Uh, touch a dead carcass who was not to partake of products of the grapevine who was raised by a mother and father of godly Nazarite influence and yet the story of Samson is a story of the violation of the Nazarite principles and the Nazarite law and every violation brought severe consequences to the point that the writer says the Holy Spirit had left him and he didn't even know it. Solomon is another example of a man who was, who was told under the law of Deuteronomy, there are things the king ought not to do. The king ought not to multiply horses. The king ought not to multiply wives. The king ought not to multiply foreign treaties, so on and so forth. And what did Solomon do? He did every one of them. And the consequences to himself, to his family, and to the nation went on for generation after generation. The law is holy. The commandment is holy. It is righteous and good. The Apostle Paul has been teaching us in Romans chapters 6, 7, and later on in chapter 8 that we have died to the law so that we might live to God. We must not construct a new set of laws by which we measure spirituality, and that's a danger for uh, the tendency of denominations, the, detenance, the tendency of the human heart is to constantly want to create standards, extra-biblical standards that... Somehow it is by this we measure spirituality. And they are all external. They are false standards which will only cause us to sin. What we must understand is the principles behind it. That I have died with Christ. I have been buried with Christ. I have been raised with Christ. And I live now in the newness of of the power of the Holy Spirit. And I obey the law because the law shows principles to protect life, principles for citizenship, principles for community. But I don't measure myself by those laws. I measure myself by falling on my knees and asking the Spirit of God to live his life out through me. The law is holy. The commandment is holy, righteous, and good. And we will find out in Romans chapter 8 that we can fulfill that law not by focusing on it, but focusing upon our Heavenly Father who, through His Son, Jesus Christ, has placed His Spirit to dwell within us. When you're confronted with standards and laws and principles... Don't let sin take that opportunity to have you rebel against it, rile up against it. But pause and contemplate what are the principles behind this. And if they're good laws, they will fall into line with love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and love thy neighbor as yourself. It's so easy to want to measure up 
But if we try to measure up under an Old Testament covenant or underneath a new legalistic society, we will only fall to the pride of self-spirituality rather than spirit spirituality. Paul says the law is holy, the law is righteous, and it reveals the sinfulness of sin because sin combines with the good law to produce sin and death in us. Let us be people who submit to the law because we have submitted to the work of the Spirit of God in our lives.